Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us here for tonight's event at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture at Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto. Uh, my name is Alex Bozikovic. I am the architecture critic with the Globe and Mail, and I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Um, and hopefully I will very quickly be able to get out of the way because we have a fantastic set of panelists here tonight to discuss the theme, uh, Reimagining a Greener City. Before we go any further, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, we will acknowledge, that the land that we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And today is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Our group tonight includes four speakers who each have different perspectives on this set of issues that we've captured with the title, Reimagining a Greener City. In Toronto, there are a number of different public policies that speak to this. Um, there are initiatives such as the biodiversity strategy, a pollinator strategy, a tree planting strategy to get to 40% tree canopy cover across the city, a parkland strategy, and a resilience strategy. So tonight, we'd like to talk about what these actually look like on the ground and how they might fit together um, and achieve a greener city in a holistic sense. So that can mean using some of the land that already exists better. There's a lot of empty land or land that is underused in an ecological sense across the city. Um, and we've got four panelists who are going to be talking about a number of different approaches to that uh, question, along with other lenses such as water, um, the ability of better land use and better landscape architecture designed to move Toronto away from reliance on green infrastructure, um, making the city more resilient. And then, of course, the idea of place, the idea of nature and what it can do for us as people and the importance of the connection with nature and the ongoing history of the Indigenous experience here um, and the Indigenous tradition of living in balance with the land. So we've got a lot of ground to cover um, and I'd like to introduce all of our panelists before we get started. Um, we're going to have Walter Kame. Walter Kame is an author of Accidental Wilderness and Walter created the master plan for Tommy Thompson Park, also known as the Lesser Street Spit, back in the 1980s. As a practicing landscape architect and ecologist, he has stayed involved with Tommy Thompson Park over the last four decades. His most recent work is the design and construction of Trillium Park at Ontario Place. Alyssa North is an Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Toronto, where her research focuses on process-based landscapes. She is an author of Operative Landscapes, Building Communities Through Public Space, and she is a co-founding director of North Design Office, a Toronto landscape architecture firm. We have Jonathan Ferrier. Jonathan Ferrier is an an Anishinaabe assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Dalhousie University with a research focus on ethnobotany, metabolomics, and Indigenous studies. And speaking first, we have Lorraine Johnson. She is the author of numerous books on native plant gardening, stewardship, conservation, and urban agriculture. And her most recent book, 100 Easy to Grow Plants, excuse me, 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants for Canadian Gardens is about growing habitat for pollinators. Lorraine, are you ready to kick us off? I am. Could I have my first slide, please? Next slide. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's great to be a part of this panel. Um, next slide, please. As Alex mentioned, the City of Toronto has a number of uh, really progressive and amazing policies like the biodiversity strategy, the pollinator strategy and others. And this work has been led by great staff and some supportive counselors. But the central question is, how are these policies supported and manifested on the ground? How are they embodied in action? So that's what I'm going to focus on, the plant level on the ground. Next slide. A crucial aspect of a greener city is functional biodiversity. Uh, this biodiversity is the scaffolding and the intricate web of connections on which everything depends. Next slide. So we have this great and progressive pollinator strategy. 
Yet on the ground in residential and commu uh, commercial and industrial properties, we also have a grass and weeds bylaw that functions as a disincentivizing barrier to growing pollinator habitat. And the last webinar in this series went into more detail about this with uh, Nina Marie Lister's presentation. Next slide. While this bylaw, the grass and weeds bylaw is under review right now, there's a real danger that at the level of enforcement, and that's like on the ground at the plant level, little will change. Right now, the city receives, enforces, and expends all kinds of resources, resources on about 6,000 um, grass and weeds complaints per year. And all indications during the grass and weeds bylaw review is that it will continue to do so without any requirement that the person complaining actually identify what the problem is. Next slide. And what this means is that aesthetic complaints from people who don't like the look of natural habitat gardens will continue and habitat uh, gardens will continue to receive advisory notices ordering compliance even if there are no infractions which is shown in this slide where the resident was ordered to remove native pollinator supporting non hay fever causing goldenrod. These advisory notices will continue to be a huge disincentive to habitat creation. And this sort of wasteful enforcement and enforcement is a limited resource won't support habitat creation on the ground where it matters at the plant level and certainly not at the scale that the biodiversity crisis and declining pollinators show that we need. Next slide, please. Another great policy is the city's tree canopy goal of 40% and the city's private tree protection bylaw. These are amazingly progressive and a lot of great staff and counselors are working hard for the urban forest. Next slide, please. On the ground though, zoning bylaws and approvals under the Provincial Planning Act supersede municipal tree protection bylaws. And so it's very difficult to retain trees within permitted as of right development footprints. Uh, the city can request that an applicant reconsider their development to retain and protect trees. And staff try to do this for what they consider to be significant trees. But if the applicant says no, the city has no resource of, uh, recourse other than to approve the permit to cut down mature trees and get compensation for tree removal. But as ecologists and climate scientists and biodiversity experts make clear, it'll take decades and decades for those replacement compensatory saplings to do what one lost mature tree has done and continues to do in terms of carbon storage, habitat, biodiversity, etc. Next slide. Or consider the policies related to stormwater on the ground or rather on the roof in terms of the city's wonderful green roof bylaw, which prevents so much stormwater from overflowing into the storm sewers and sending untreated sewage into the lake. Next slide. At the ground level, at the plant level, there are millions of missed opportunities for the low tech, low cost rain garden and water infiltration garden solution, or at least mitigation. And I should mention that this slide on the right, sorry, it's not Raindrop Plaza, it's Fair, Fairford Avenue Parquette. They've got very similar designs um, led by landscape architect Sheila Boudreau. Instead of encouraging and supporting such gardens with commitment, we've opted for the hugely expensive and habitat destructive big pipes and tunnels. And I should mention the mouth of the dawn naturalization, which is amazing. And we need more of this, more of what nature does more of nature's solutions. Next slide. We need to listen to the very important reminder in the Truth and Reconciliation Report that, quote, reconciliation also requires reconciliation with the natural world. We, and I'm speaking here as a settler, need to take this reconciliation message to heart as a guiding principle for action at the ground, at the plant level. So what are some possible visions for regreening the city at the plant level on the ground? Next slide, please. It's a city in which all downspouts drain their gift of water into infiltration and rain gardens to replenish groundwater, not fill storm sewers. Next slide. It's a city in which people are not afraid to grow meadows and prairies because of bylaws. And indeed where the city encourages it and supports it by growing native plants in city greenhouses to give away or sell at cost to community projects. Next slide, please. 
It's a city where Indigenous stewards are paid by the city to do stewardship in natural areas. It's a city full of Indigenous-led protected and cons conserved areas. It's a city where Indigenous land stewards lead the high park burns. It's a city where Indigenous land stewards lead invasive plant management and removal based on Indigenous principles of honorable, honorable harvest. Next slide. It's a city with greenhouses and parks that community groups can use to grow seedlings of food plants to address food insecurity and to grow native plants for pollinator projects that support food growing. Next slide, please. It's a city that facilitates and supports seed collection from heritage trees and supports residential tree nurseries like the one Eric Davies is leading and where the city does this too with tree seed nurseries in front of municipal facilities, for example. Next slide, please. It's a city with demonstration naturalization plantings everywhere, especially on city owned land and municipal facilities. Next slide, please. It's a city of productive boulevards that contribute to ecological functioning. What if the resources that currently go into enforcement of the six 6,000 grass and weeds complaint per year were instead devoted to turning all of the ditches like this in Etobicoke into wet meadows. Mm -hmm. Community groups such as Project Swallowtail are doing this work as volunteers, but how about the city also doing this work or supporting this work all over? Next slide. And finally, revisioning a greener city means revisioning the phrase, we're all in this together so that it actually means something. Thanks. Thank you, Lorraine, so much. Uh, next up, we have Walter. Walter. Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending. Let's really talk about reimagining the city. And I want to reimagine it's 1910, 1920, and you live in Hogtown. You go from the Humber River to the Don River, and we have watersheds, we have ravines, and we had dirt roads north of St. Clair. So what did we do? We went to the cottage. We went to the beach, the beach homes and cottages. We went to Toronto Islands. We built cottages and sustainable small window cottages. And we went to Sunnyside Amusement Park. We went to the cottage country. And on average, the bungalows then were 1,000 to 1,500 square feet. And today, reimagining the city, we have shrunk to condo living at 600 square feet. So we, we really regressed from the 1920s, but now we're still searching for cottages because the Northerners don't want us because of COVID. We can't afford them as Skokas. So what do we have? We have city parks and reimagining today, let's go to the next slide and uh, let's go into it very quickly. And when I started working on accidental wilderness, Tommy Thompson Park, I really started here in the seventies an avid bicycle rider, a rower in the, in the Hanlon Boat Club, and I saw rubble. I got the commission in 1986, and I said, wow, this is amazing. As a New York City kid, I was aware of rubble, and I thought, this is something else. We have to start with nature. What is nature going to do here? Next slide. And there we have it, rubble. Every landscape architect's delight. Yeah, usually now we bring in topsoil. Here we had no budget. Not in contrast to today, we had no money to do anything except dump rubble. And the clay turned, to, the bricks turned to clay, the concrete blocks turned to aggregate. Next slide. While the Caledon Hill was now here, we bulldozed three to 400 trucks a day. We charged 30 or 40 bucks a truck. We made money and we created a new five kilometer spit. Next slide. And there we have it, 1990s. And I said to myself, I'm not gonna start with traditional landscape with people. I looked at that regional map, birds from South America, Mexico, trees uh, coming in, shrubs coming in, trees blowing in, and engineered cells to take the dredge eight from the dawn. I said, no, these are terrible, they're terrible. You gotta make wetlands out of them. Next slide. And we have Andre Lenotre, I mean, not Versailles, this is the construction road. And one tree, I discovered a snowy owl in that tree. And I said, wow, this is amazing. 14,000 nesting seagulls, terns, hardly any people then. Next slide. Well, what an LA. 
my plan then was to look at this from an ecological, biological perspective, and then bring in the cultural perspectives as well. Friends of the Spit, John Cauley, embayments, wetlands, baselands, habitat, sandy soils, rubble soils, beaches, flats, little ponds, warm water embayments. Next slide. And then the drawings, how to create engineered cells, trapezoidal cells into wetlands, working with the wind. As I call this, this is landscape design where you create the table and let nature create the menu. I high pot spots, low spots, wet spots, dry spots, and walk away and leave it. Don't have money for planting. There's no budget. Next slide. And there they are. Now it's a world center for birding. It's a Bird Canada hotspot. Next slide. Let's go through these quickly. Images of the park. I call this cottage country. Dunes, wetlands. This is our new cottage country. The condo people come here. Next slide. It's packed. We've seen tenfold increases in traffic this year alone. Next slide, these embayments, birds, herons, the triangular pond that was to be filled in. The whole site in the aquatic park area was to be Billy Bishop Airport. We fought tooth and nail to keep this as a natural sanctuary. That's to be seen today. We have a beaver dam that's lived there for years and no rent. Next slide. But we have canvas back ducks and we have now the people. And what do they love? The rubble. I think every park reimagining a city should get rid of mechanical playgrounds and bring rubble into every park. Kids build, they climb, they create. Next slide, and they relax. Mental stress released. You look at the city, the contrast between Toronto as the urban wild, the forest city, the connected city, the botanical city. Maybe the reimagining, we've got to change the name from Hogtown into some other name. Toronto, Chicago is the windy city. London, Ontario, the forest city. Maybe Toronto should be the botanical city. Next slide. And the Lenotra, LA, just leave the wet ditches alone. And you know, Lorraine, look at those ditches you were talking about. This is the bicycle path and these majestic Gothic cathedral, the cottonwoods. Next slide. It's there to be seen. Cottage City. Okay, you know, we now go to Ontario Place, Tulliam Park. And I said, okay, if we can do this in Tommy Thompson, what do we do here? Eight acres of parking lot. And let's, next slide. And now we got to think about the future, the reimagining the city. Eight acres of parking lot. Good old Joni Mitchell. She said, we did it. Best views of the city. Got rid of the parking lot. Next slide. Worked with Patrick Morello, Andrew Gruz. We went and developed a plan based on the morphology of Ontario. Drumlins, eskers, ravines, pebble beaches, sand beaches, deciduous trees, boreal trees, Carolinian trees, St. Lawrence trees. Over a million people visited Trillium Park last year. Can you believe that? Eight acres, a million people. Next slide. And then I began to think of, hey, next slide. If we can do this at Trillium Park, where can, why can't we do this for the rest of Ontario Place? The boulders, the moraine, the drawings. I went up to the Macquarie, 280 foot boulder wall. I built in the quarry at Dwight, Ontario. Next slide. Places to play. Forget the manufactured playgrounds. Climbing hills, rocks, caves, grottos, nooks, crannies. I mean, this has become one of the major features. I was there today again today. Four kids couldn't wait to climb. Not one accident in four years. Love it. People love it. The white pine coming out of the rock. It could be the cottage country of the north, except it's now cottage country in Toronto. Next slide. Liberty Village is 10 minutes away. Look at the kids. People come here because 600 square feet locks them in. We become squirrel cages, chicken coops. We now have views, vista, stress relief, the way into the country. Next slide. And then I said, okay, we have one of these great resources. We have the marina that in the 70s, I used to come here with Kelly's Irish Jester's music. Why not have, instead of just a marine strategy for down the inner harbor, the ferries from the inner harbor to Ontario Port. Forget Ontario Place, Ontario Port. Cruise ship, the St. Lawrence cruise ship. Let's bring back, I go to Spencer's in Burlington. 
bring back restaurants, pubs, culture, book shows, art shows. The 2026 Visa soccer games are gonna be here. The international games, bring people down on green bridges from the exhibition place to um, Port City, Ontario Port. Next slide. So then I started thinking, well, if we can do the forest in the east, we can have the nautical village in the center and places for a Budweiser and entertainment and science and technology, food production in the Zydler pods, a forest park on the west. And how about the rest of the Humber Beach reimagining this city? We have an, a thousand meter, a 600 meter rowing uh, uh, dragon boat course that was built a while back by the Conservation Authority. It was meant to be a thousand meters. Going back to the 1920s, Sunnyside Beach Amusement Park, we had the Toronto Port Commission has built the breakwater. It's now all these years later falling apart. Time to rebuild, reimagine the city. Next slide. So there's the plan I'm producing and actively working on. We've got staff hired for the summer to complete our plan for city council. The Humber with its Tommy Thompson Islands, Trillium Park, boulders, beaches, bird habitat islands, Lakeshore Boulevard, the Garden Expressway, everything, the high park, the great park we have cut off from the waterfront. We now have the Christie Cookies site, 16 buildings, another 15,000 people with one hectare of open space. This is ridiculous. If anybody goes to the Humber Shores, I was there this weekend, the Martin Goodman Trail, it was packed. You couldn't move. We have such a deficit in waterfront space. Next slide. And then you look at these connected Norton Goodman trails to islands and restaurants, people living in condos wanting to rent boats. I met a guy the other day, he had an eight foot six kayak and I said, that's kind of small. He said, that's the only thing that fits into my elevator. I said, wow, there you have it. Palace Pier Point, the Humber Light, end of the Humber, pollution deflection from the river. There's only eight the blue flag beaches in Toronto, none in the Humber. Next slide. The water quality is shy. Oh, look at this. Filling with sediments now from Scarborough Bluffs. Hey, my plan is happening without anybody doing anything. You can't go up the Humber anymore. And what do people do? They go to the 1912 breakwater just to be out on the water. Cottage country. Next slide. And look at the density of that new development. Oh, my goodness. This is the pride of the Humber Sunnyside days. 19. I mean, can you imagine what this was like in 1912? And this is what we have now. And when we have flooding, next slide. You've, the breakwater was invisible. We washed away trees. We lost our beach. We spent a lot of money just recharging beach. But you know what's left here yet? Nature. Same as Tommy Thompson. People make their little paths. They want to be on the water edge. Next slide. Uh, and then I had this vision the other day. I did another plan. I said, you know, I saw some images of the Portlands. I saw the way the industrial landscape was being shaped into brand new landforms. Why are we still dealing with the picturesque of Capability Brown in the 18th century? Let's do something here. Kevin Lynch, image of the city, a new gateway into the city. Dunes, walkways, wetlands, art, bringing art back to the waterfront. Next slide. I started playing with the idea of a I had this on my desk. And what happens if you had something instead of a lighthouse, a pyramid? Then I started thinking with Robert Burley. Robert's co-author with me on the book. Next slide. And I, you know, saw Ryan's photography of the Portlands, and I said, this is majestic. I mean, what a new landscape we could create that really talks about the 8 million cubic meters of soil that's coming out of the Toronto Ontario Place subway line. 800,000 from Toronto Works, about 300,000 from the Christie development. Why can't we do something as land art? Smithson did the spiral jetty. Why don't we have something unique on the waterfront? Land art in Toronto. Next slide. Oh, the Mayas and the Aztecs, they thought about it a long time ago. Uh, look at this. So why not a landform where nature and culture blend together? I would love to see a restaurant here. I can just imagine kids on mountain bikes. Next slide. It's ending it now. 
and we were imagining this city, maybe Toronto, the wild city, the edge city, the ecologically based city, where you have boardwalks and we commune with nature. Can't get to the Muskokas, you can't get the provincial parks, they were all sold out. Nobody wants you up north. Let's create a cottage country in the south. Next slide. And I think of Jonathan now and all the moose, the uh, new, uh, the credit of the Mississauga, walk gently on the land. Let's have a new environmental ethic in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. So we've moved from some sensitive stewardship of the land to uh, some visionary expansion of the land, you might say, and uh, working with what we already have. Um, I was showing the panelists before we started one of my uh, relics from the spit, uh, which I have a bunch. Uh, during the pandemic, the Leslie Street spit has in fact been my own family's cottage. I've been swimming there. Oh, look at that. It's been great. Um, but let's move on please to Alyssa. Alyssa. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> the Black Oak Savannah of High Park is home. An ecosystem dependent on change, specifically fire, is how it thrives. This principle of landscape change has guided my career. My research practice and teaching have been influenced by this process-based approach to landscape design, and I truly believe it is how we can go greener in cities. Through my research, I explore building biodiversity by replacing the corporate monoculture lawn and cutting CO2 emissions from mowing. Mown lawns also use excessive amounts of water and require frequent application of synthetic fertilizers. Las Vegas is seeking to lead the nation in banning non-functional turf to find as grass that no one ever uses or walks on. Yeah. Through the graphic analysis of corporate sites, I determined that the average site is typically one third mown lawn. The annual cutting of corporate lawn emits 20 times the amount of CO2 that a typical mid-sized car emits per year. Lawns used only for visual carpeting. I found three case study sites that no longer mow. At Herman Miller, Grassland Prairie allows a site to be irrigation free and very low maintenance. Trails provide opportunities for employees to take walks during lunch, promoting healthy people in a healthy environment. At Husky Injection Molding, natural succession ensures that biodiversity increases over time. Small parking pods separated by amply planted median berms facilitate healthier regenerating trees, shrubs, and perennials. At the Ford Rouge factory, a natural stormwater cleansing system includes a massive green roof, constructed wetlands, vegetated swales, and porous pavement. With reduction of suspended solids, the natural system is one third the cost of traditional gray infrastructure. From operative landscapes to more exciting green examples, Dockside Green is a housing complex where wetlands define public and private spaces and green infrastructure abounds. At Monikenhuizen, an open rainwater collection system defines a landscape. It contains and recycles rainwater in ponds and wetlands during rain events as spectacular water flow emphasizes the water cycle. In this research of Downsview Park, I examined how the process-based winning design has become more conventional. Photographically documenting its development, much of the park is mown lawn with sparsely planted trees and poor soil. Over 10 years, the lake is little changed, mown lawn still reaching its edges. Alternately, in some fantastic pockets, the landscape is finding biodiverse balance. Wildflower meadows surround a healthier pond, birds and insects abound. Planted and self-seeded trees find company together and water-loving vegetation has discovered the low-lying areas developing layers of green. We aim to apply these principles in our landscape architecture works at North Design Office. Our city is a challenge. In our plaza for the Estonian Center, dense birch forests and geological reference would provide cultural significance. City standards mandate that trees are spaced seven meters apart and birches are not approved city trees, despite the fact that birches are also cultural in Ontario forests. Settling on a combination of maples and birches, urban microforests will remain a greener future agenda. Material decisions are critical for going greener. At Dufferin Mall, existing material reuse defines the concept. Rearranged and aligned with a historic creek, landfills are spared some waste, a new aesthetic to create a unique public space. Further up the watershed at the McMichael, our new trail connects the gallery and the group of seven cemetery. 
providing opportunity to physically connect the spaces and also connecting cultural and ecological history, now curated ecology thrives where a parking lot existed. A bioswale cleans water and plants that are becoming rare are reintroduced. Through research and consultation, now woodland species where lawn existed, historic and current plant uses layer educational use on the landscape. And for the last segment, teaching green visions for the future, ideals formed by extensive research. I encourage my students to innovate landscape architectural ap approaches in solution to the myriad issues facing Toronto's ravines. Positioned by the idea of a landscape infrastructure loop of ecological integrity, the organizations we have partnered with have been enthused by our academic visions that can ignore the practicalities of policy. Students have envisioned aligning ecological and infrastructural agendas to reframe the hybrid system of the ravines and manage flooding while experiencing the evolving landscape infrastructure conditions. Reintroducing managed habitats to support butterfly populations, accepting the ravines as invaded by both plants and human species and inverting the destruction to initiate process-based design of ecological integrity. Proposing lateral connections through the city, forming resiliency loops, co connecting ecological corridors to co-benefit co turtles and humans, creating regional connections to support migration and prairie habitat through grazing, examining ravine policy and through land use recoding, creating dynamic uses between city and ravines, accommodating flooding where city densification allows public river access and both architecture and landscape filter urban runoff. Mitigating flooding by allowing erosion and deposition to continually develop land and a healthy vegetation. And with autonomous vehicles, green infrastructure can dismantle expensive subway gray infrastructure to create a parallel operative ravine to combat climate change and support biodiversity in a new vision of urban nature. Whether built or imagined, there are several common themes and successful visionary projects. To attain these, we will need to accept that our landscapes will sometimes be dormant and brown, less mown, unfertilized, unmanicured, and a bit wild in order to reach greater ecological function and adaptability in urban environments. I think Toronto is ready to reimagine a greener city. Thank you. And thank you, Alyssa, for taking us through your practice and some of your ideas about uh, this city. Um, a number of sort of provocative specific ideas uh, to work with here. Um, before we get into our discussion, our final speaker, Jonathan. Anu Bojo, Jonathan Ferrier, Michisagi, Nishinaabe, and Nini, and Disnikas, Nemoshek, Misagas of the Credit First Nation, Treaty 19, Dojiba, Ahau Miigwech, Gichimanadu, Mi'kma'ki, Niganagana, Ahau Miigwech. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Great Spirit, the land I'm on, Mi'kma'ki, and our relatives. I send prayers in all directions for healing and our continued good work on the land, Miigwech. I'm a biology professor at Dalhousie University and a teacher on the Board of Education at Miss Sagas of the Credit under the leadership of Councillor Veronica King Jameson. Next, please. The inspiration about ecological frameworks in MCFN territory comes from my passion for teaching and researching about the land where my community and family once lived. Here you can see Michael Johnson, Nishnabeg homestead map of red dots depicting MCFN camps in the blue boxes. Next, please. My ethnobotany work focused on revitalizing our traditional ecological knowledge and relationships we had on this land. Part of our work includes understanding the colonial framework that impacts our community's natural stewardship role. In yellow are the locations where my family were subjected to colonial servitude, born in captivity on farms that were created by clear cutting and colonization roads. And that's some of the history of the colonial normalized framework we're dealing with here. Next, please. However, in a time of ecological crisis, international research shows that biodiversity wellness is linked to indigenous language wellness. The land and our relatives are the inspiration to our language, Nishnabemwin. Here today, the message is, our place names provide an approximate 20,000 year old ecological blueprint for addressing the ecological crisis. My gold standard is ensuring the indigenous ecological framework exists. It's protected or it's being revitalized. 
Here we uh, were enslaved in our winter migration grounds in yellow. Uh, and Eremosa here, it translates to packs of dogs or packs of wolves, Nemoshek. Next, please. A few blocks over on the Grand River, Beshna Glenning, uh, which means uh, the one that washes the timber down and drives away the grass weeds, we can see how newcomers clear cut the forest for firms and criminalize wolves, Mangan or Nimosh, because they, they hunted their cattle. However, the wolves were the Mississauga's guides for hunting elk and deer. Yes, elk. We need to honor our relatives going forward, even the so-called invasive species. For this, the Mi'kmaq phrase, Etawakmam, two-eyed seeing by Elder Donald Marshall, acknowledges the strengths of many cultures, including our plant relatives, native and non-native included. And this helps us move forward in complementary ways. Next, please. Look closely and you will see that the Mississauga's ecological blueprint is all over the territory. Here in Donald Smith's map, Toronto's true name, once Scotonach, translates to back burnt grounds. A story I recall is that this references the fire torches ancestors used for spearing fish at night. It's not poaching, it's our way of feeding our families. Sadly, however, native salmon were trapped into extinction. I dream of a day when the Atlantic salmon return to Unscotanach. Next, please. Here, a spear that's being repatriated to the Mississaugas of the Credit found in Adobico, which means place of the alders. Adobico community, are we able to spearfish uh, by torch? How are the alders doing? Our well-being needs these answers. Next, please. At MCFN's Harvest, we're revitalizing the lessons from the land because we pray for a future that supports our traditional foods, medicines, and ecological blueprints that can pull the territory back into balance. Next, please. Our Sweetwater Harvest for maple syrup from Ninadik, sugar maple, is one of the oldest traditions of this land. The forest and the sugar bushes are also very important for water filtration. Next, please. Clean water is very important when considering harvesting the good food on the water. Wild rice, minomen. Here, Elder Mark Salt has taught me how to dance wild rice after the rice harvest. You can learn too at the annual fall harvest. Next, please. These relationships and cultural events on the land are protected by allied neighbors and other projects like Elder King's Moxon Identifier Project. Check out our website here. Next, please. So I'm asking for your help. Please learn about our relatives, our old ways, and our place names. They'll help you see a green city and live a healthier home with, for generations to come. Chimigwech, Bamapi. Miigwech, Jonathan. Um, that was fascinating. Uh, I'm learning a lot tonight on a number of different fronts. Um, and we've got some time now to discuss between us and then to open it up to the audience as well. We have one question in the Q&A now, which we will get to. Um, and audience members, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A. Um, I'd like to start if I can start with a, a little bit of controversy, perhaps, by um, picking up on something that Jonathan said. Um, Jonathan mentioned the idea of welcoming different species, welcoming so-called invasive species into the landscapes that we inhabit. Um, that is an idea that, as I understand, um, the sort of the conventional um, ecological convention is not one with which some professionals agree, uh, to say the least. So can we maybe begin with that? Um, what does it mean to, uh, how should we be thinking about regulating the presence of invasive species? Um, is there a cultural as well as a scientific aspect to this question and how should we think about answering it? Anybody? I can take that. 
Yeah, uh, I can use some examples from out here in Mi'kma'ki and uh, uh, well, when I when I think about invasive species, I I think about uh, some of the plants that are on the land uh, that are really quite beneficial to our medicine, uh, like the the large plantain, for example. Where where would we be without the large plantain that's able to heal our wounds so well? Uh, Another uh, important species, uh, well, I believe it's important, is uh, the Japanese knotwood, knotweed, sometimes called. Uh, this plant, uh, you find it in disturbed habitats, and it's fantastic at holding together the edges of uh, disturbed sites. And it really plays quite an important role in maintaining uh, the habitat and re-greening some, some rubble places. So it's one of those first uh, uh, plants that gets onto the scene. Another great benefit of the Japanese knotwood is that it, it has so much resveratrol in the roots. That's a red wine uh, compound, uh, the antioxidant. And out here in Mi'kma'ki, that's a really important uh, compound to have in your medicinal repertoire. Uh, since it treats uh, Lyme disease. So this is a way that we can use two-eyed seeing, uh, taking the best of all those cultural worlds, including our plant relatives, and uh, uh, making uh, complementary ways forward together. If I could just add to that, uh, my perspective of nature is with global change, the only thing that is constant is change. And I spoke to an elder at Pond Inlet and he saw a robin land in the high Arctic. And he said, oh my God, what's the name of this? It's an invasive species. And they said, no, no, that, that robin is going to help eat all the insects and it's going to be very beneficial. So Jonathan, when you and I first spoke, you said you didn't have a word in your language for invasive species. You said the first thing we wanted to know is what can it do for medicine and food to help us? So we now have 40% of Tommy Thompson Park are species that have moved north and they're doing quite well. And a lot of birds like them, a lot of insects like them. So you gotta say, let's make friends with our new arrivals. Listen, I'm from Germany and Poland. I'm an invasive species. I wouldn't be welcome here unless there was tolerance. Well, thank you for that. Um, Alyssa, do you have any thoughts on this question? Yeah, I guess I, you know, there, there are, you know, certain, certain checks and balances that I think matter. Um, speaking from a landscape architectural perspective, um, you know, if you have objectives in mind that may have to do with, you know, uh, how the design looks or a sort of, um, a, you know, a specific curation of plants, you know, because they have an educational agenda. Um, you, you might want to go in and remove some of the ones that are out competing, you know, what you have initially planted, um, but you, you, you're, you're never going to, you're never really going to win. <laughs> and so the idea that there's like a range of tolerance to me, I think is really important. Um, and I think one of the most beautiful uh, things my, my dad ever said at my wedding, and he said, my daughter actually taught me to see wildflowers where I once saw weeds. And I think those are the types of the, the perspectives that we need to notice and change. I go on, Lauren, please continue. Yeah, I think it could also involve asking different sorts of questions and, and um, noticing the sorts of um, relationships that Jonathan is referring to. So um, instead of um, approaching it as how can I get rid of this plant? Rather asking, what is this plant telling me about, about what is going on in terms of the relationships, uh, in terms of the soil, in terms of you know, how all the other species are using it or not using it, how, how humans might use it, asking very different questions and learning from it, from those in, invasive, so-called invasive plants. And, um, and uh, yeah, not just looking at, on them as the enemy, but looking at uh, them in relationship to everything else within the ecosystem and trying to create ecosystem health and complex relationships and thanking them for the service that they do and then 
harvesting them for the the things they provide. Interesting. So is it possible then to, uh, and I ask this as a lay person, is it possible to create um, healthy ecosystems, biodiverse ecosystems that may have different mixes of species than have traditionally existed? And should we, if those come about or if we create them, should we embrace those? Within I don't see e ecosystems as a word that's a constant. The only thing that's constant is change. So I'm saying that we have neo systems. There are new systems evolving. Tommy Thompson Park is an example of an evolving system, not seen before, a system based on rubble, uh, a system based on birds flying, fish migrating, animals bringing stuff back and forth. So we have new categories that we have to think about. It's not just longer, no longer the, the Great Lakes ecosystem or the Carolinian ecosystem and the, Car the traditional Carolinian areas. Carolinian species are moving into Toronto now. Are they invasive? No, I just planted pawpaw today. Uh, I'm gonna wait to see it, I want the fruit. It's coming up from Kentucky and West Virginia. Let's see what happens. I wanna, I wanna sell it in St. Lawrence Market. Is it invasive? No, it's responding to climate. Well, that's an interesting point that the species that there are species that traditionally have not done well in this place in the world, but will do well because of these incremental changes in the climate, right? Exactly. Habitats are moving. It's a, it's a fascinating thing that uh, we're going to see, you know, in our lifetime, significant changes that will allow, you know, other species that might not have done well to, to do well. Uh, Toronto is planting Kentucky coffee trees as a street tree now. Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> So to change tack a little bit, um, you know, Alyssa talked at length uh, about her research and her practice uh, and about the idea of trying to introduce native species and particularly um, pollinators back into land that has been filled by mowed lawns. Um, we have a question from Sarah Morsovsky excuse me if I've mispronounced your name. She asks, um, what about the applicability of pollinator and tree protection to lands controlled by hydro and railways? She's saying that where she lives, there's a lot of mown grass that could be wilder. Is that something that is happening elsewhere? Is it happening here? Should it be? Uh, well, I, I mean, that's, it, it's definitely uh, a huge amount of territory and the mowing of the lawn is, this is the, the kind of fundamental issues is that there'll be so many competing interests on, on a particular, um, on a particular patch of lawn. Hydro has issues because they obviously can't let any trees grow to a certain height because it's, it's actually going to be sort of a physical danger. But I, I think there, there should be a wider range of tolerance of what can happen. Um, and, and a lot of our corridors, I think there, there is a little bit more acceptance in terms of, you know, what can, what can go to meadow. Um, and then, you know, maybe, maybe mowing less frequently sometimes can be an option as well. You know, a one time a year uh, mow rather than, you know, every two weeks for that perfect green lawn, you know, there, there definitely always compromises. So, um, you know, I, I think in the urban conditions, there's always so many, um, often conflicting stakeholders. And this is what the landscape architects are having to navigate. You know, this person wants a tree. This person wants them seven meters apart. This person wants the soil deeper. This person says the soil is too deep. And, and, and then, you know, after the whole deal, you're able to get one tree into the design. So it's, you know, I, I think there needs to be a, a lot more sort of tolerance and leeway. And I think that will come when our attitudes start to, you know, start to change. Of course, though, when it comes to public safety, that's always going to end up being number one. But we see right now there are big moves taking place. The Meadowway Corridor from the Rouge, 16 kilometers of hydro corridor. I'm do, right now doing a design for a pollinator garden as a gateway to the Meadowway. The whole Meadowway is going into meadow. We're taking, the Conservation Authority is plowing it, putting in wildflower meadows. So we're getting rid of the lawn deep rooted pasture grasses, flowers, and the garden I'm designing now will be an entrance to one of the main points in the meadowway. So we have opportunities in front of us. Pipelines, railway lines, the railway lines to me is another one I really should look at, all those corridors. 
But Hydro with Corridor with the Meadowway is a good one. It's a positive re-emerging of the city. And of course, bicycle riding, hiking, the cottage country, a lineal cottage country, <laughs> if I could put it that way. Right. And um, in Toronto, the um, you know the city now has a plan for what's called the Loop Trail to, um, yeah. sort of, to stitch together the existing yeah. and multi-use trails in the valleys, uh, which would create a continuous loop linking the Humber with the Don, and then from the Meadowway heading east over towards yeah. the so, Exactly. Which would have... Uh, implications for um, biodiversity as well, right? Allowing species to travel on the forest, right? If they're continuous. Yeah. Um, here's a question and very interesting question. Uh, Jonathan, I'll let you take this one first. Um, it's from Catherine Goddard or Goddard. Um, she says, um, my concern is that we humans are so self-focused and short-term focused. Ecological and evolutionary time is measured in thousands of years, whereas introduced species and focusing on lawns has already changed our ecology within a very few years. Isn't that the crux of the climate crisis? This is Jonathan? Uh, uh. How do we think about uh, the human scale of time and a longer scale of time and balance the um, the sort of the lessons or the imperatives that we face looking at immediate needs and and the longer term or anyone else if if you like i think uh the the place where i begin is to uh see how we can reinvigorate and revitalize our indigenous ecological uh ways of living and uh when those come uh, back or at least supported, then we can begin to uh, see and have space to integrate um, some of the, uh, the, the newer arrivals in the territory. And I think uh, as a standard, when we're seeing that um, some of those uh, traditional uh, stewardship roles start to revitalize, I think there will be naturally space um, for other uh, new coming species uh, to fit in just, just well and harmonize uh, in balance with the other species. But I think, like I said previously, our, our indigenous language is linked uh, to uh, our biodiversity and our biodiversity in the territory is quite important uh, for protecting uh, the land and the ecosystems and the relatives within. Thank you. I think we have a huge problem. I'm on site in Tommy Thompson or Trillium Park or the Humber Shores every day in the week. I watch young people on a trail, a forest trail. They have their cell phone in front of them. They're walking the trail, stumbling into a rock, not aware. They're not seeing, they're not intuiting, they're not in harmony with nature, they're in harmony with their electronics. I see what's happening in schools, where you're taught to take your plant snap and snap a picture of a plant and then look at your camera to see if you can identify it, but you're not seeing the plant, you're looking at the image. So what happens is then we lose the spiritual connection, we lose the fascination of the flower, of the leaf, of the emerging spring bud. And I think we're becoming obscured from the essence, the beauty of nature, the aesthetics of nature, because we have become involved with the cell. Mm -hmm. Not the plant cell, the technological cell. I think it's a huge issue in education today. Well, I mean, there are efforts in within the education system here and elsewhere, there are other actors such as, um, excuse me, Evergreen, um, you know, who are working specifically on this issue. But, you know, do city parks have a particular role to play in that respect? Should we be designing city parks and open space in cities to provide uh, biodiversity, to provide an intimate and varied experience of nature, rather than perhaps one that is more controlled? Yes, absolutely. Um, but I think one of the things that we'll take is um, uh, a vision of, well, a revisioning of what parks can be for. 
And so, um, you know, pollinator demonstration gardens in every single park it's 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 such an obvious you know uh, one of the huge problems as you know we've all been talking about is this disconnection from nature this idea that we're separate from nature this idea that it's not a part uh, that it is not a part of us and so how do we connect with that in the places that surround us and parks are those public spaces to build that connection to build that relationship and to be a part of of nature and recognize that within ourselves. But yeah, Lorraine, you know, I've always wondered why we have de rigueur manufactured play equipment in the park. We're spending tens of thousands of dollars. Every park has to have a playground. So the kids have an average life span on the playground of 20 minutes. And we're spending an enormous amount of money. I would suggest that we could put rubble piles in every park, like the adventure playgrounds in Scotland. In Denmark, I've studied these with Lady Jane in, in England. And kids learn, like the Waldorf School, the Montessori School, Evergreen, they learn how to use their hands, how they engage with natural materials, how to build and deconstruct, build and rebuild. And what an incredible learning experience. And it's vital for them. I see it every day. They love it. Four hours instead of 20 minutes. I met four kids this morning. And they spend four hours on climbing rocks. So I think that natural, whether it's big pollinator gardens or na native plants, what have you. But here's the issue. I was working in a recent park where I was told by city maintenance people, we don't want more than two trees because they're dirty. They have big leaves and we have to rake them. I said, okay, we'll use honey locusts, small leaves. Okay. So talk about biodiversity. <laughs> we have our maintenance policies that are dictating design. And we don't want shrubs because they're messy. We want grass and lollipop trees. That's now. So how do we get over that issue? And not only weeds and gardens and pollinated gardens. There's a change of mentality here. Well, that's kind of interesting and distressing to hear. Um, you know, I mean, adventure playgrounds, which I agree are fantastic, uh, you know, may not always be so practical in a public park for legal reasons, you know, justified or not. But, you know, I've heard what you're saying, Walter, from a number of other people um, in government and out that there is a something of a cultural shift is needed um, in terms of how we approach public parks. And that's beginning and people in government are in Toronto are trying to make that change. But uh, the sorts of concerns that you talked about, um, you know, and the sorts of ideas that you talk about that things that are easy to maintain, things that look consistent and things that look neat um, are what we should be shooting for. Um, this seems problematic. Uh, so in the 1980s, I interviewed Ivan Forrest, the parks commissioner at that time, Jack Kimmel was head of forestry and we wanted to do wild gardens in the city. Hmm. And he said, oh, I'm Ivan Forrest, we've just completed a public survey and the citizens of Toronto want neat, orderly park spaces, okay? This is policy. So, you know, we have her perk came in with Susan Richardson and they said, we want an ecologically based approach mm -hmm. into the nineties. Mm -hmm. And then that stopped again. So I, I, you know, we have these policy shifts in the city about what is a public park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the, uh, the nice stories that I can bring from the Credit Valley Conservation uh, Indigenous Advisory Group that we worked with was, uh, the answer to, to Walter's concern actually is how do we uh, reincorporate spirituality and ceremony back into our park experience? And uh, so we've been making integrating uh, ceremonial spaces, ceremonial teaching spaces. Uh, so uh, land-based learning activity uh, can come into play in the park spaces. And uh, it, it offers a, a nice way of uh, re-establishing those relationships uh, with our relatives in these park spaces. Well, that's a lovely idea of introducing um, an idea of, of ceremony uh, into the way that uh, the public spaces are used. Yeah. I'm sorry, please continue. Someone was going to speak? Okay, I was just going to ask um, you know, whether that to take that thought in a slightly different direction. Um, if we are 
thinking about parks or if we agree that we should be thinking about parks as places that are doing providing different functions that are being used in different ways than they had been. Um, should we also be thinking about other kinds of uses than ceremonial ones? Does it make sense to provide, let's say, um, commercial uses? Does it make sense to put, you know, dining against parks? Or do we want people to be using parks in different ways at different times of day? And should we be thinking about programming differently? Is there a connection between um, programming and the experience of nature and our use of parks. My, yeah. my observation at Tommy Thompson Park, when I interview people and I'm incognito, I, have, I don't give them any idea I've been involved with it. I say, why are you here? We're here to feel free. We're here to get away from programs. We're here to get away from our squirrel cages. We want to be able to have adventure, mystery. We want to go to the water edge. We want to sit on a rock. We don't want a bench. We want to be communing with nature. I see it all the time, the Humber, people sitting on the edge and they're doing their own thing. They don't want to be programmed. They don't want stuff happening. Mm -hmm. Another place where we can find a lot of traditional foods is in the parks. And I think, you know, maybe some uh, identification of some certain trees uh, in Nishinaabe names uh, would help uh, facilitate uh, or satisfy people's hunger. <laughs> no pun intended. I think, I think the same way that, you know, we need to increase vegetative biodiversity, I think we absolutely need to create the diversity that's available for people in parks. I mean, just the amount of activities that people want to do. And I, I can think of, you know, specific small restaurants in parks in Europe. And then, you know, you go, you walk around and you can grab a beer and have a seat, you know, by, by a grass patch. And it's just like there, that opportunity that there's just a lot of opportunity. I think our parks are definitely under programmed, um, but I don't think they need to be programmed in a way where then it's dictated what you have to do. But I think more opportunity in our public space will make human life richer the same way more diversity in our plant life will make biodiversity stronger and richer and with that expanded repertoire and difference it just makes everything stronger. Here's my experience on that. We started out at Trillium Park with a ceremonial fire pit. Room for 16 people to sit around the fire. North, south, east, west, the First Nations people would come and sing to the morning sun. All of a sudden, we found out that people wanted to use the fire pit. At Ontario Place, we've now added four fire pits. At the Humber Bay Shores, there are barbecue areas that people make their own fires. They're bringing their own food. They're coming in with families of 10 or 12. They're making their own ceremonies on their own place in their own time. So now the rentals for Ontario Place are nonstop. You charge people to make their own restaurant. They make their own, and the interior place provides the firewood. So it says to me that something like the European, the Arab tradition of the before, people are baking, people are bringing their own hammocks and hanging between trees that have been nicely spaced. They're bringing their own kayaks. They're making their own programs. I find that rather exciting. Don't have to have a, 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 a Humber Shore is controlled by restaurant groups. You know, you can then do anything unless you go through a, a restaurant owner, at least for 20 years. People say, screw it, we're going to build our own restaurant. And it's kind of fascinating that they're, they're occupying their cottage country. Well, it might just be that uh, we need both, that there are people who have the opportunity and like to take the opportunity to find their own experiences and to create their own experiences in places like uh, Tommy Thompson Park and also in urban parks that people you know, particularly if they are parents or if they are older or perhaps if they just don't feel like working that hard, um, you know, might benefit from other forms of amenity in public parks. Uh, Alex, I agree with you totally, but why is it on the Humber Martin Goodman Trail, there's not one restaurant? I have to go to Burlington. Where is a good waterfront restaurant in Toronto? That's it. We've got the Grenadier Group who controls the Humber Bay, but we have another group that controls the beach. And they and, don't want a competition. And then you okay. get to Toronto Island, um, you know, one of the most magnificent, um, you know, 
I was going to say natural places, but one of the most magnificent landscapes in the city, you know, much used and you have a choice of bad hamburgers and pizza pizza. Um, you know, even in yeah. the kind of incredible restaurant building that's there, you know, there's terrible food. And I think that is, you know, that is a problem. And, uh, you know, it's a quirk of the city of Toronto that, uh, that needs to be addressed because it's a kind exactly. of... Exactly. Uh, but one of, one of the ways that we can actually think about food and parks, though, in a way that it's in relationship to something else we've been talking about, which are these plants, these introduced plants, so-called invasive species that create monoculture and, and disrupt the ecology of these long evolved relationships, is if we did programming that related to actually harvesting the, the Japanese knotweed and creating that amazing, um, wonderful, almost rhubarb-like compote that you can create with it or garlic mustard pesto. And if you imagine, uh, you know, lots of people doing that in a sustained way, harvesting and using what, the, what that plant is offering and then relating to the space and then thinking, oh, okay, this, this pl these plants are creating monoculture. Well, what we need, this is calling us to stewardship. This is calling us to creating ecological health by, you know, tending the earth and, and planting native plants and, and restoring those relationships that the introduced, um, you know, species like knotweed, et cetera, are disrupting. So anyway, that's another way to get food, to think about food in parks. I'm amazed at the number of people out harvesting dandelion leaves for salad. Unbelievable. It's a traditional, you know, a lot of people eat dandelion leaves. Yeah. Um, one last, I think we should take one last question because we're already over time, but this is a fantastic question from Jessica Hui. Um, she says, thank you. And she asks the panel, you know, what are some of your favorite pollinator, hummingbird or medicinal plants to grow in a greenhouse that provide the maximum ecological benefits once introduced into our green spaces and gardens? Well, pretty well, any of the native uh, meadow and prairie species are amazing for pollinators and super easy to start from seed and grow in greenhouses. So plants like Culver's root and beard tongue and golden Alexanders and um, yeah, uh, New England asters and goldenrods. The native goldenrods are fantastic and very easy to grow in greenhouses and uh, support pollinators. The native cone flowers, um, the native uh, sunflowers, they're all great for pollinators. Thank you. Any other suggestions or is that good? That's good. That's a beautiful list. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe add mullen for uh, COVID purposes. Mullen? Yeah, it's a great medicinal that soothes the lungs. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and, and I suppose if people want more specific suggestions, they can always um, buy Lorraine's book. Um, but I, we should probably wrap up. We're a few minutes over time already. So um, thank you all for your presentations. Thank you all for this engaging conversation. It's absolutely been a pleasure for me to be here. And thanks to all of you for attending this event. Uh, the event has been recorded. It will be available on YouTube after we're finished. Um, but I'll say good night. And thank you very much to the Daniels faculty for having us all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.